So we're just waiting to start. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us. This is session two, and today we have two awesome other presentations. We started off with microorganisms and looking at um, resistant organisms on Monday, and today we're going to be talking about um, infection prevention in the community and high-level disinfection. My name is Cheryl Garrix Lloyd. I am president of the Omega Kappa Chapter of Sigma. Welcome to everyone who's joining us in the Zoom room and to all those who are joining us over on YouTube. We are live streaming. Just a few housekeeping matters before I hand over to our moderator for today. I'm reminding everyone, please have your microphones muted. You have been let into the Zoom room, but I'm reminding you, you need to be in here with your full names, Christian names and surnames so that we can have your attendance done. Joining us over on YouTube, we also ask you to type your full name in the chat so that we have a record of you being here. And then we're asking you to remember, if your colleagues or friends are joining, remind them that they too are to come in with their microphones muted and to use their full names. So that is just our little reminder for today. We thank you so much for joining us for the second session. And today our moderator, is going to be the one of the members of our leadership succession committee, Mr. Desmond Coker, and I will hand over to him. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Madam President, for that introduction. Um, so today again, we, we continue in our series of infection control, and uh, we realize that infection control is so critical, especially in this, in this period of our history where we're dealing with, with this great pandemic that is doing such great havoc. And so, and so we want to start off our session this afternoon. Um, um, before we do so, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for giving us the opportunity where we can come again once more to learn of how we can keep ourselves healthy and how we can also inspire others to also remain healthy. We thank you for the presenters who will be sharing their knowledge with us this afternoon. I hope that we would indeed learn something that we can put into practice and help others also to be able to put into practice so that we can all be living healthy and happy lives. Please be with this session we pray in Jesus precious name, amen. Okay, so as was advertised, today we have two presentations lined up for us. Um, the first one will be infection control in the community and it will be done for us by Mistress Sandra Chisholm Ford. Sandra Chisholm Ford is a registered nurse, registered midwife and a public health nurse who currently lectures at the University of the West Indies School of Nursing, Mona Campus, where she also obtained her Master's of Science degree in nursing education. She's an active member of Omega Kappa, Omega Kappa chapter of Sigma Theta Tau International and a member of various professional organizations, including Caribbean Network of Nursing and Midwifery Educators and the Nurses Association of Jamaica. Mrs. Chidham Ford has been working in the field of nursing for over 20 years and has been consistently involved in community development through her passion for volunteering. She is a member of the UWE Sons Friends of 
Mourner engaged in outreach activities in the Mourner High School, a board member of the Seaview Gardens New Testament Church of God Basic School. And she is, has mentored students at several primary and high schools. For the past 19 years, she has been conducting wellness activities as well as providing maternal and child health services to over 400 citizens of the Whitfield Town community on a weekly basis. Aside from her talents and advocacies, Mrs. Chisholm Ford is also the author and co-author of several publications. Ladies and gentlemen, this afternoon, I present to you Mrs. Chisholm Ford doing the topic for us, community uh, infection control in the community. Good afternoon, colleagues. Thank you very much, Desmond. Um, thank you for having me. So colleagues, this afternoon, I will be looking at infection prevention in the community during COVID. And as we know, we have been having some challenges, but as nurses, the show must go on and we have to continue our practice within the hospitals as well as those of us who have community-based practice. So at the end of this session, we just three objectives. We will be reviewing COVID-19. We'll be outlining work health safety and we'll be reviewing the donning and doffing in the home. So briefly, we will look at COVID-19. COVID-19 virus was spread mainly from person to person in close contact with each other, then mainly through droplet infection, through coughing and sneezing. It is also spread by to uninfected persons when they touch surfaces or objects that contain the virus, as well as when the virus is picked up on hands and it is transmitted through the, to the face by touching the mucous membranes of the eyes, nose, and the mouth. And as the COVID pandemic continues, we must evolve and change our nursing practice to meet the changing needs of our clients in the community. So the components of the COVID-19 recognition and prevention must not impede these routine and necessary practices that we must offer to our clients. So therefore, it is expected that home care providers maintain adequate supplies of adequate appropriate PPEs so that they, as well as the patients that they serve are protected from COVID-19. And of course, hand sanitizers is an important part of their work health safety obligations. So home-based care, for those of us who do home-based care or public health nurses or mental health practitioners and so on, we provide um, care in the homes and this must continue. But of course, we must modify the practice so that there is minimal impact on the patient's care activities. So um, home-based care is generally practiced by the public or community health nursing services. And, and generally we know who these people are and they are our public health nurses, our mental health officers, our nurse, family nurse practitioners, or community health aides, or registered midwives, or psychiatric nurses aides, or public health inspectors, as well as our nursing students mm -hmm. and student midwives. We all, as healthcare practitioners have a personal responsibility for our own health. So therefore we must have personal health monitoring. So we ensure that we clearly communicate to all of the staff and students who are going out into the community that they need to monitor their own health. 
If you are not feeling well, please do not go into the person's homes. If you're having any symptoms of illness, which includes a cold, flu-like symptoms, even if these symptoms are mild, please do not go into these homes. It is very difficult to distinguish between a common cold, the flu, and COVID-19 as these symptoms are similar. What we must also ensure is that all staff that are interacting with the patients and their families in the homes are immunized. Annual flu vaccines are required and we also ensure that the COVID-19 vaccines are taken up by the nurses and other healthcare professionals who are going into these homes. So the symptoms that you may have if you are exposed to COVID, and, and this is just a refresher for all of us, fever, cough, shortness of breath, sore throat, headache, loss of, loss of smell, loss of taste, a runny nose, muscle pain, joint pain, diarrhea, nausea and vomiting, as well as loss of appetite. And of course, very important, your hand hygiene moment. When delivering care to clients in the community, the hand hygiene moments are, first of all, before you enter the client's home. Before you touch the clients, after you touch the client or any surface within their home, and as soon as you exit the home, you must do your hand hygiene. So these are the four main hand hygiene moments. As we go further down in the presentation, you will be taught about other hand hygiene moments that are practiced, are expected while in the home. It is important when you're going out to ensure that you have access to liquid soap, hand sanitizer, and disposable hand paper. Before you go out, there are several things that you need to be mindful of. You must be mindful of organizational policies that cover any unforeseen circumstances or accidents that may happen while you are out there in the community as it relates to exposure to infection. It is also important to ensure who is the team lead. So that person who is responsible for managing and coordinating the efforts that are going on as well as the responses of the team members and you must be whoever is responsible for providing information to the clients and families about what will take place in the home and if the situation changes, if whether we're going to come in or we're going to be staying outside, this must be communicated to the family. We need to know who is responsible for that as well. A record of staff members who are not well and who have recovered from the, uh, from the COVID-19 must be kept. Clients who are staff members who are just recovering, we ask that you wait a little bit longer, two weeks to a month after recovery from COVID-19 before entering the client's home. We also advise that persons who are not in the habit of taking the flu vaccine, please, it is very important, especially during this time, to take your flu vaccine annually. And a record of all staff immunizations must be kept. Additionally, we must ensure that we have an idea of who we're going to be seeing. So we need to review the client's docket before we go out. Um, make sure we have all the contact information for the client, their phone number, their family's information, we also want to determine whether we're going to be going directly into the home or we're going to be, be going through a family member. And 
we also need to be mindful of how COVID-19 is transmitted. So standard precautions are used when patients are undiagnosed, whether or not they are diagnosed with COVID. Are we clear? In this time of COVID, whether or not your client is diagnosed with COVID, you still use standard precautions. So, however, if the client has any respiratory infection that, whether or not we know it's COVID, if they're, if they're having a flu, if they say, oh, it's just my sinus draining, and we're not sure what it is, if they're having a fever, cough, shortness of breath, we need to be mindful and be cautious and use all the precautions that we are trained to use. So in the home, it is important to, as I said before, perform hand hygiene before and after every episode of contact with anybody within the home. We must safely use and dispose of sharps. We must be careful about how we dispose of the items that are used during the home visit. And we are to be cleaning everything and sanitizing everything that we take into the homes and when we're taking them out of the homes, especially our reusable equipment, such as our, our thermometers, our GMR machines, our blood pressure machines, and so on. We must conduct and encourage respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette. And some persons may think that uh, okay, I, I'm having, I, I have a mask on so I don't have to cover when I'm coughing. You have to encourage and educate every member of your team as well as your clients. You cough into a mask, you remove it and replace it with a clean one. That is very important. You also avoid touching where possible. So you do not touch anywhere in the client's home unless you have to. And you must manage your waste and anything that you use as it relates to linen appropriately. Using your PPEs when in contact with blood or body fluids, or if you are going to be restraining your client for any reason, especially the persons who, are, who practice community mental health, the use of PPEs is very important, your gowns, your, your face shields, and so on. If PPEs are required, you must use new PPE for each episode of personal care. What it means is for each client you're gonna be serving, even if it's three different clients in the same household, you change your PPEs. You do not ever reuse the same gown, surgical mask, or eye protection for the same client at a later time. I know we are short of resources and we may say, okay, I'm, I went to see Mr. Brown today. Let me roll this up and I'm gonna go see him tomorrow. So I'm gonna be reusing it. That is not allowed. That is not recommended. You do not reuse any PPE for different clients as well. So one PPE, one client. Eye protection may be reused if appropriately cleaned. So your face shields is the only PPE that is recommended that can be reused. However, it must be cleaned thoroughly between uses. And of course, hand hygiene before and after every contact with your client. The next important part is contact and droplet precautions. It is important to note that when caring for clients who are suspected or confirmed COVID or any other respiratory illness, you must use contact and droplet precautions. And contact and droplet precautions include 
donning of gloves, surgical masks, and gowns, as well as it may include protective eyewear. So let us go to our, the part that we love most, donning and doffing of PPEs. So of course, you don't wait until you go into the home before you put this on. You're going to be donning before you enter the client's home. You are going to be doing your hand hygiene before you don and your PPE should be removed in a way that prevents contamination of your clothing and your hands and the environment. So later on, you're going to be taught a sequence of donning, doffing, and hand hygiene to ensure that while you're out there, you do not inadvertently infect yourself or your colleagues. You should wash and sanitize your hands between removal of each item and after all PPE has been removed. Of course, safe disposal of PPEs is paramount again. Gloves, gowns, and masks must be disposed of in biohazard waste bags. And we know what these are, the little red bags. However, because of shortage of equipment, again, we may have a challenge with finding infectious um, waste bags. So in the event that you don't have your red bags, you're going to be using double bags, two garbage bags. So it's one, and after you have put your, your PPEs, your used PPEs in that one, you're gonna seal it, and then you're gonna place that in another bag. And then this is tied securely and disposed of with other waste. So you don't have to take this waste back to the health facility with you, it is double bagged. It is now safe to be discarded among the client's regular waste. And of course, you must perform hand hygiene between touching of each bag. So you put your used PPE in one bag, you perform hand hygiene, then you put it in another bag, and then you perform hand hygiene again. So hand hygiene is performed most when you are in the client's home. Ensure that you reduce your risk of exposure to aerosols. Of course, sometimes it depends on the type of visit that you are doing. You may have to ex um, exposure to per um, clients who use nebulizers or CPAP machines. When you go into these homes, you must ensure that you are not exposing yourself to these aerosols. So if the plant is in a room, the plant is COVID positive or you are suspicious of COVID, you do not go into the room if they use CPAP. You find a different room and make sure that that room is closed while you are in the home performing the nursing care. So of course, all of us know what nebulizers are. And you know that they create a mist. This is a potential for spreading the virus into the air. So while you're in the home, you limit the use of nebulizers and, and ensure that spacers are used in the event of um, any respiratory distress if you're going to be doing um, rescuing the client from respiratory distress. And I, as I said before, for clients who are using CPAP, Make sure that you do not enter the room that the CPAP is being used. And if you need to, ensure that you do not enter the room until after an hour after the CPAP has been switched off because of the potential risk of the COVID-19 virus being Okay, it looks like our presenter got hit off there. So let's hold on a little to see if she will come back. Okay. 
Thank you so much, Desmond. I will just check quickly with her in the interim. Just another quick public service announcement. As I'm letting people into the room and I am doing the register, there are some persons in here with double barreled names who did not use it to enter and some people are using it here who did not register with it. We are using the name you registered with. Please amend it so that we have the right person. Thank you so much. That's how we have let you into the room. We're also asking you to remind anybody who you know who's waiting, can you please ensure they have changed their names because I'm not sure how they're in here. And I'm also saying that we have some colleagues who know they are not registered for today and they have joined the session. We do not want to encourage or promote any kind of dishonesty. Nurses have a lot of integrity. So I'm asking you to have that addressed as well, please. I'm just going to check with Mrs. Chisholm for to find out if it's the internet that she lost. Thank you for your patience. All right, so there was just a brief power outage and she is coming back just shortly. So we thank you for your patience. All right, so while we are waiting um, on Mrs. Chisholm Ford, let me just throw something out there for those who are here and waiting. How many persons have been practicing donning and doffing? I'll take some hands by the reaction or some yeses or noes in the chat. Let me see how many people have been donning and doffing. All right. I think we've let Mrs. Chisholm forward in, but I'm not hearing. Who are the people done in arms? Oh, I've seen the hands. Wonderful. So for the questions regarding the session, just make a quick note until she's done. I was just pulling in the space for our moderator and the presenter. So good for the hands. Now you need to, re when she's teaching us, remember if you're, you're going to learn if you're doing it right or not. All right. Mrs. Chisholm Ford, you're back with us. Yes, Mrs. Garrix Lloyd, I am back. I'm trying to find my slide. Thank you. This is just on board. Are those persons in your background? They're a little noisy. Not a little, Madam Chair, a lot. All righty. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Bear with me and our unreliable power supply. Thank you for understanding. Let me, do I need to turn my camera on or are we fine? Hmm. Madam Chair, Madam Moderator. We're fine. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so we have to think of cleaning. This is an important part of our infection prevention and control in the community. 
And of course, we must clean before we disinfect. You cannot disinfect a soiled surface. So cleaning reduces soil load, and of course it allows the disinfectant to work. So our responsibility as home care providers is to educate the family on how to properly clean their environment using the usual um, household products that they have. So of course, surfaces that are touched frequently must be cleaned with a detergent or a detergent slash disinfectant wipe several times a day, as well as if it is visibly dirty or soiled. And it's important that we do this education because going in, you are exposing yourself to infection as well as ensuring that the family will protect themselves as well. And of course, cleaning removes microorganisms such as the COVID-19 virus. And it, this is, of course, we use a combined detergent or disinfectant wipe or solution. Note well that a two-step clean requires physical cleaning with a detergent followed by disinfection with a chlorine-based product such as bleach. And be mindful that the bleach will not kill the virus if the surface has not been cleaned with a detergent first. Always be mindful of that. So it does not make sense you throw disinfectant on a dirty surface, it will not be effective. Alrighty, so you're going to be using stuff while you're in the home, so you must be able to dispose of these personal ways. So you must dispose of these, as I was saying before, in infectious um, biohazard waste bags, or alternatively, if you are unable to do so, you store them in your disposable garbage bags, as I said, and these bags should be double bag, tied, secured, and of course, you perform your hand hygiene. Hand hygiene must be performed and gloves must be changed when performing different procedures on the patient. Example, if you're given an injection, you and you're using gloves, you change your gloves if you're going to be doing a dressing change afterwards. So you make sure you take enough of the equipment that you're going to be needing to be using in the home. Of course, reduce your risk in the home. And how do you do this? You limit touching of surfaces and equipment. You change your gloves when torn, if they are visibly contaminated, or as I just said, between all your procedures and of course, performing hand hygiene. Reducing infection to your um, risk of infection to yourself also means that you remind your patient or client that they need to regularly clean any equipment that is used frequently, such as the CPAP machine, masks, wheelchairs, walking, glucometer machines, and so on. Anything that possibly may be infected with the COVID-19 droplets. And of course, as important as hand hygiene is for you, it is important as well for your patient and the other persons who are in the home as well. Of course, uh, when we are going on to, in order to do home-based care, we must be transported. So it is important to determine the number of healthcare providers that you travel together in the same vehicle. We have to maintain our social distancing so we do not cram the vehicle with healthcare professionals in order to get the job done. You would be exposing persons unnecessarily to infection. And of course, you must maintain principles of hand hygiene while, being, while transporting the staff and the client where we place our bags, because uh, some of us, we leave our bags nowhere. We take our bags everywhere we go, even on home visits. So we need to be mindful of that. Also, public health nurses are required and coming to health aides are required to take a, a visiting bag with them. So that bag needs to be placed properly and the seating arrangements and airflow in the vehicle must be observed and practiced. So before transporting patients, um, especially if they are suspected with COVID, 
you must determine the type of vehicle that you need to use. So if you're gonna be using an ambulance, ensure that the compartments are separated. So the driver's section is separated from the section that is carrying the patient. If that is not possible, there are seating arrangements that are used that minimizes the risk of transmission of the virus from the client to the driver or other members of the health team. We must also be mindful of the capability of the patient and what level of assistance that this client will require, as well as will this client be able to wear a surgical mask while being transported and, and will the client be able to practice respiratory etiquette while being transported as well. So before entering the motor vehicle, both the driver and passengers are to perform hand hygiene. Of course, using an alcohol hand rub. If the driver will not have direct contact with the patient, driver is to use droplet precautions. If in direct contact, then both contact and droplet precautions should be used by the driver. All handbags are to be placed on the floor of the vehicle and not on the seats. And this can also be placed in the overhead compartment in the ambulance, or if there's any, if there's a storage compartment, or we call it the boot, then this, that's where they are stored. Passenger is to sit in the back passenger side of the ambulance, diagonally opposite the driver, and as far from the driver as possible. If the passenger has symptoms, yes of respir respiratory illness, or possibly if they are confirmed with COVID, they should wear a surgical mask, perform hand hygiene, and be educated regarding proper respiratory hygiene. So we, and we advise and educate on how to cough and so on while being transported. They should be provided a plastic bag, tissue and halka, or alcohol hand rub. So they, they should be carrying this. So while they cough, they will be disposing of their things in the plastic bag until, um, and there'll be sanitizing between using of the tissue until it's time for them to exit the ambulance. The driver is also to wear a surgical mask and protective eyewear during the transportation, as well as performing hand hygiene. The driver should do this before assisting the passenger, before entering the motor vehicle, on exiting the motor vehicle, after providing assistance to the passenger and after dropping the patient off and before returning to the vehicle. Airflow safety while in the vehicle. So the airflow should be checked to minimize that recirculation um, otherwise, the airflow will be from the passenger compartment through the heating or cooling vents. So you have to know whether the air conditioning in the ambulance takes air from one compartment to the next. Because There are some vehicles that has one AC that feeds the entire vehicle, while others have two separate controls. So it is preferred that the vehicle that has two separate controls for air conditioning is used. If the vehicle has one, it is best to use the windows open and use outdoor air. Okay? Waste management. Waste from COVID-19 patients really does not require any special uh, management. So therefore, as long as it is bagged properly, either in the biohazard bag or your double bagging, you should, it can be disposed of within their own waste streams. Um, PPEs, unless they are contaminated with large amounts of blood, can be disposed of as well in the plant's garbage system. If it, is, if it has a lot of blood, then we ask that you take it back and it is disposed within the hospital or healthcare facilities um, disposal facility. Of course, anything that is designed or designated as being sharps must be discarded into a sharps bin. And this is 
the part that I want you all to be mindful of, the donning, the suggested donning and doffing sequence while in the client's home. Of course, before you, before you don, you're gonna perform your hand hygiene. Then you're gonna put your apron or gown on, followed by your mask, then your eye protection or your face shield, then your disposable non-sterile gloves, which you are going to be using when you're in direct contact with the patient. All right? Then you have done all that you're doing for your patient and you're going to be duffy. First that comes off is your gloves. Then you perform hand hygiene. Next, you're going to be taking your apron or gown off and perform hand hygiene again. Then you're going to take your eye protection or face shield off. Then you perform hand hygiene again. Remove your mask and then another hand hygiene session. So after removing each item of PPE, you must perform hand hygiene. And of course, we all know why. Each, each item is considered as contaminated. So removing each is exposing you to possible infectious material. So you must perform your hand hygiene after doffing each item. And of course, of course, and I'm ending soon, hand hygiene must be performed before bringing your hands towards your face. I have my slide for my questions and I thank you all for being. Thank you very much, Jillian Ford, for such a comprehensive and detailed presentation on prevention in the prevention of infection, infection prevention in the community. Um, our next presenter is going to be presenting to us on high level disinfection, high level disinfection and um, her name is Lillian Lewis McDonald. Um, she works as, as the infection prevention and control nurse at the Victoria Jubilee Hospital in Kingston. Um, fulfilling God's plan for her life and being the best vision of herself are her ultimate goals. One of our biggest achievements to date is that of achieving Nurse of the Year Award 2021. We want to congratulate Nurse McDonald for that achievement and welcome her to the platform as she presents to us this afternoon on high level disinfection. Over to you, Mrs. McDonald. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share. Are you hearing me? Yes, we are. <clears throat> All right, so we are going to be speaking about high level disinfection, high level sterilization this afternoon. And um, sorry, just trying to maneuver my. <laughs> Thank you, Alrighty, so let's get into it. So at the end of this presentation, we should be able to define cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization. 
as well as how to identify levels of sterilization, look at the factors that affect sterilization, and discuss some of the agents that are used in sterilization. So this infection really is the process that involves, I heard my, my previous colleague speak to not moving from cleaning to not starting from disinfection, but you, you really have to begin cleaning the surface of any visible implements before objects before you move into disinfection. All right, so I'm not really giving this, I should have had it in the order, but I'm not really going in the correct order here. Nevertheless, disinfection describes a process that eliminates many or all of the pathogenic organisms, microorganisms, except bacteria spores on inanimate objects. In the healthcare setting, the objects usually are disinfected by liquid chemicals or wet pasteurization, and there are various factors that affect the efficacy of the disinfection, disinfection um, that can be used or disinfection. And it, this can be, you know, a limited, it can nullify or limit the efficacy of the process. Here. I'm sorry, my slide is stuck. Okay. All right. Unlike sterilization, disinfection is not sporadicidal, and some disinfections will kill the spores with prolonged exposure time, like three to 12 hours. And these are called chemical sterilants. And at similar concentration, but with shorter exposure time, over 20 minutes. For example, a few percent glutaral diet, this can achieve, you know, the disinfectant levels of killing all microorganisms except for the large. Um, sorry, Mrs. Ones. Lewis McDonald, we're not yes. sure what's happening with the the um the screen. Yes. Uh, Mrs. Susan Ford said she would go ahead and share for you, and then you could just tell her when to advance, oh. since your screen is jumping, because all we're seeing is blinking. Oh, it's jumping on my end. Okay. Yes. So what would I do? Just stop my stop the sharing, screen. yes, and just allow her to bring up the PowerPoint, okay. so you will be able to and let her know when to advance. Sorry about that, everyone. Okay, not a problem. The demo. All right, so what slide are you seeing now, please? Are we on the same slide where we're speaking about online sterilization, disinfection is not protocol? No, she's not. She's putting up the screen share. No, we're oh, not seeing okay. it just yet. Okay. Just okay. remind her what slide you were on so we can just get right to that. We're not sure why yours is blinking, but we're not seeing it clearly. Oh, okay, I'm sorry about that. I am on. What number is this? Probably about disinfection, unlike sterilization, that one. So All right. I'm not sure what number that is. All right. Um, Desmond will let you know when it's up. Thank you, Mrs. Chisholm, for it. I'm, I'm, I'm having my, an issue. Can I, can I let her continue until I can find it? I'll jump in when I can. I know. So, so I continue. All right. Thank you, Mrs. Chisholm Port. I know many people like to follow along while the presentation is going on. Um, go ahead, Mrs. Lewis McDonald. We'll just try to catch up with the screens because we aren't, yours was blinking and we weren't able to read it just the same. Okay, I'm sorry. All right, so let me just pick up I, again. Unlike sterilization, disinfection is not sporadicidal, but some disinfectants will kill spores with prolonged exposure time, for example, 3 to 12 hours, and these are called chemical sterilants. At similar concentrations, but with short exposure periods, 
um, example, 20 minutes for 2% blue carotid, the same disinfectants can kill all microorganisms except large numbers of bacterial spores, and they are called high level disinfectants. All right. This is Louise McDonald. You went mute just now. Okay, sorry. I'm I'm having fun. Okay. So low level disinfectants can kill most vegetative bacteria, some fungi, some viruses in a practical period of time, probably give or take um, 10 minutes. And the intermediate level level disinfectants might be side off for microbacteria, vegetative bacteria, most viruses, and most fungi but not necessarily kill bacterial spores. Germicides differ, differ markedly and primarily in their antimicrobial spectrum and rapidity of action. Cleaning, like I said before, is to be the first step and it's to remove all of visible soil, um, organic or inorganic material from objects and services and normally it's accomplished manually or it can be done mechanically using water with detergents or enzymatic products. Thorough cleaning is essential for a high level disinfection and the sterilization because inorganic and organic materials that remain on the surface of instruments will interfere with the effectiveness of these processes. Decontamination removes the pathogenic microorganisms from object, objects so that they are safe to handle use and be discarded. Sterilization, oh, this is a process that leads to the destruction or elimination of all forms of microbial life and is carried out in healthcare facility by physical radiation or chemical uh, methods. Physical methods can be through steam, dry heat, hot air, or filtration. And radiation can be done through an ultraviolet light system. Chemical methods through the use of formaldehyde chemical sterilizers, as I mentioned before. There are levels of sterilization, and there are three levels where, that I'm going to be speaking about high level, intermediate, and low. The high level disinfection process kills all vegetative microorganisms, the microbacteria, lipid, non lipid viruses, fungal spores, and some bacterial spores. The intermediate level kills microbacteria, most viruses, bacteria, and it is registered by the Environmental Protection Agency, CP, as a tuberculosis. Right? The low level disinfection kills some viruses and bacteria. Factors that affect sterilization. Factors that affect the efficacy of both disinfection and sterilization include the prior cleaning of the object. Like we said before, if you did not clean thoroughly, then you're not going to get an effective disinfection or sterilization of the object. Organic and inorganic load that is present, and the type and the level of the microbial contamination. Concentration of the exposure time to the germicide, and also the physical nature of the object, if it is a lumen type, previous changes, that kind of a thing, and the presence of biofilms. The temperature and the pH of the disinfection process and in some cases, relative humidity of the sterilization process can be a consideration. Mrs. Lewis McDonald, yes. excuse me. Um, we have the we have the slides up now. So if you can um, let us know where that is uh, for now, where you are oh so that we can follow along. I am at important considerations. Uh, All right. You're at, yeah. down. It starts by saying all candidated items. I don't I don't have the numbers, I'm sorry. So all right. Uh, yeah, we yeah, she, she's at that slide now. So so um so let me see if I can come back to that. Okay. All right, thank you. So all candidated items, example, the brazier or pool, substance tips, endoscopic yes. or arthroscopic equipment should be cleaned using a three-step process. And this three-step process includes flushing, using copious amounts of water, brushing with an appropriate diameter brush, and rinsing using the correct brush size for the lumen. It, that's critical to create an effective cleaning friction against the lumen walls. 
and if the brush diameter is too large, the bristles are going to bend backwards and then you will not be able to effectively struggle with the debris. So the brush, and if it's too small, it's not going to be effective. The friction is not going to be making contact with the item. So this is going to have in, inadequate treatment going on. Continue. Next slide, please. Any successful infection control program must consist of a multi pronged approach, which may incorporate issues such as the preoperative antibiotic use, the choice of antiseptic and disinfectant, the traumatic care removal during surgical patients, preparation, clipping, best practices for prepping, breaking, and proper housekeeping methods in addition to the sterile process. So we need to control, you know. There's a difference between disinfection and sterilization. And um, sterilization is really the destruction of all the microbial life, whereas this infection involves the use of a chemical sterilizer or agent to eliminate virtually all recognizable pathogens, microorganisms, but not necessarily all types of microorganisms, like the bacterial endospores present in an inanimate object. Next slide, please. So, when is disinfection appropriate? So disinfection, like we said before, um, can be high, intermediate, or low. So when we have except in a dental um, situation, we'll come in contact with mucous membranes or not in contact skin. So if you you know that this thing is gonna come in contact with the mucous membrane or non in non in intact skin, you need a high level disinfection. If you are using some items that are, you know, at intermediate level, some, some semi-critical items, some that are non-critical, non and the low level are the non-critical ones. So if those that are going to be in the, in, in the, in, with an intact skin, then you will have to, you can use a low level disinfection. For sterilization, however, you have to sterilize all equipment that are going to enter the school or a vascular system or you know anything to do with the blood flow. And that's a part of this There are classification of medical devices. So there are some critical medical devices. And these, I don't know. I'm seeing someone say that the audio is a bit poor. Let me speak up louder. Critical, a device that enters normally sterile tissue. Or the vascular system where blood flows, and these devices are like surgical instrument needles, intravenous catheters, and these must undergo sterilization. Those that are semi critical, these come in contact with the intact mucous membrane and do not ordinarily penetrate sterile tissue, like a laryngoscope, thermometers, flexible endoscope. These should receive minimal high level disinfecting. And the non critical ones are the ones. That you know are in contact with the patient or just touch the intact skin, the bedpan, the blood pressure cuff, the stethoscope. These should be cleaned using the low level of disinfection. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. All right. So, are all reprocessing personnel properly trained or certified? And um, this is something I saw where uh, a lot of persons will complain, especially when it comes on to using some of our chemical sterilants. We are sometimes not properly trained, not informed about how, you know, the proper PPEs to wear. You know, I guess some persons believe that we've been mixing um, the side so long, so you just go on mix. But there are actually laws in other states that have been, um, you know, passed as it relates to how persons who are using these, these uh, sterilants are supposed to wear, what, what PPEs are necessary and the training that needs to you know, be done. So that is something that we need to look into. Next slide, please. Cleaning and verification. Ensure that all items are surgically cleaned before high-level disinfection liquid chemical sterilization, or other forms of sterilization like steam, ethylene, oxide, hydrogen peroxide, gas, plasma, plays a key role in ensuring the quality of outcomes. And its importance cannot be overemphasized. There are several ways to accomplish this goal. And first, we must 
you know, adhere strictly to what the manufacturers will say. And this is something that we, a lot of time, fall short on because some of the things we get as gifts, so we may not have gone the actual manual with it to indicate how do you actually clean this, what are the chemicals that you should use, what kind of cleaning can it take and all of that. So this is something too that we need to look into with in terms of getting the manufacturers, the instruction for manufacturers used so that we know exactly what items, what, what can be cleaned with what. Continue. Disinfection and sterilization are essential for ensuring that medical and surgical instruments do not transmit infections or infectious pathogens to our patients. And because sterilization of all patient care items is necessary, healthcare policies must identify primarily on the basis of items intended use, whether cleaning, you know, disinfection, or sterilization, as I would say before. Continue. Types of disinfectants. So many disinfectants are used alone or in combination, like the hydrogen peroxide and the crisis acid in the healthcare setting. These include alcohol, chlorine, chlorine compounds, formaldehyde, glutaraldehyde, orthophyllaldehyde, hydrogen peroxide, idophores, parasitic acid, phenolic, and quaternary ammonia compounds. Commercial formulations based on these chemicals are considered unique products and must be registered to the EPA or cleared by the FDA. And in most instances, like Given product is designed for a specific purpose and it should be used in a certain number. Therefore, users should read labels carefully and ensure that the correct product is selected for the intended use and applied efficiently. Next slide. Agents to disinfect and sterilize. So alcohol, and we use alcohol a lot in our city, and even now too with the advent of COVID-19, a lot more alcohol is being used. In the healthcare setting, alcohol refers to two water soluble chemical compounds, ethyl alcohol and isopropyl alcohol, that have generally underrated germicidal characteristics. The Food and Drug Administration has not cleared any liquid chemical sterilant or high level disinfectant with alcohol as the main active ingredient. And these alcohols are rapidly bactericidal rather than bacteria static against associated forms of bacteria. They also are tuberculosidal, fungicidal, and viricidal, but not destroy the bacterial spores. Their cidal activity drops sharply when diluted below 50% concentration, and the optimum bacteriocidal concentration is 50 to 90% solution in water. Most times, I don't think we have that much or sometimes we really don't pay attention to the label, so we do not even know how much alcohol is in the different solutions that we're using. The most feasible explanation for the antimicrobial action of alcohol is denaturation, denaturation of the protein. This mechanism is supported by the observation that absolute ethyl alcohol and dehydrated agent is less fast. Bactericidal than mixtures of alcohol and water because the proteins are denatured or quickly in the presence of the water. Protein denaturation also is consistent with the observation that alcohol disturbs, destroys the dehydrogenases of E. coli and that ethyl alcohol increases the lag phase of the enterobacter aerogenesis. And that the lag phase effect could be reversed by adding certain amino acids. The bacteriostatic action was believed to cause the inhibition of the production of the metabolite essential for rapid cell division. Next slide. <clears throat> so we spoke a lot about bacteriostatic versus bacteriocidal. So when things are bacteriostatic, it means that. This agent will only inhibit growth and reproduction of a bacteria versus bacteriocidal, where it actually kills the bacteria. And this is inclusive of some disinfectants and antibiotics. Right. Microbial activity. 
So the methyl alcohol methanol has the weakest bacteriocidal action of the alcohols and thus seldom is used in the healthcare setting. The bacteriocidal activity of various concentrates of ethyl alcohol ethanol was examined against a variety of microorganisms in exposure ranging from 10 seconds to one hour. And the Pseudomonas was killed, Ariadonia genosa was killed in 10 seconds by all concentrations of ethanol from 30% to 100%. The Serratia, Martinez, and the E. coli and the Salmonella typho, typhosa were killed in 10 seconds by all concentrations of ethanol from 40% to 100%. And these, and I'm sure in our related studies that I found relating to the different um, uses of alcohol and why they would have decided that you know it's more micro micro it's more bactericidal versus bacteriocidal. The gram positive organisms of Staphylococcus aureus and Staphylococcus pyrogens were slightly more resistant and being killed in 10 seconds by ethyl alcohol concentrations of 60 to 90 percent. And the isopropyl alcohol was slightly more bactericidal than the ethyl alcohol for the E. coli and the Staphylococcus. Next slide. So, the ethyl alcohol at concentrations of 60 to 80% is a potent viricidal agent in activating all the lipophilic viruses like herpes, influenza, and many hydrophilic viruses like the adenovirus, the rhinovirus, the rotavirus, but not hepatitis. And the isopropyl alcohol is not active against the non-lipid enterovirus, but is fully active against the lipid viruses. So these have demonstrated that the ability of the ethyl and the isopropyl alcohol to inactivate the hepatitis B and the herpes virus and the ethanol alcohol is to inactivate the human HIV, the rotavirus, and the astrovirus. Next slide. In 1964, Spalding stated that alcohols were the germicide of choice for tuberculosis activity, and they should be the standard by which all tuberculosis are compared. For example, he compared the tuberculosis activity of either four, and, uh, which is a substance, a substituted phenol and isopropanol using the Houston loop test and the determined that the contact times needed for complete disruption were 120 to 180 minutes, 40 to 40, 45 to 60 minutes, and five minutes respectively. Next slide. So this is giving more information about the alcohol, the more studies that they have done. So ether alcohol was the most effective concentration for killing the tissue of the cryptococcus neoformans neuroformant, the blastomies, dermatitis, and the other names that are listed there, and the culture phase of the latter three organisms aerosolized into their surfaces. The culture phase was more resistant to the action of the ether alcohol and required about 20 minutes to disinfect the contaminated surface compared with one minute of tissue. So all of this is just giving us information about the studies that they've done. You can continue. Next slide, please. So studies involve the uses of alcohol, and I know this is very small. So I'm just gonna highlight that um, alcohols are not recommended for sterilizing medical and surgical materials, principally because they lack dispersal action and they cannot penetrate protein-rich materials, all right? They have been used effectively, though, to disinfect oral and rectal thermometers, hospital pages, scissors, stethoscope, and have been used to disinfect fiber-active endoscope. But failure of this disinfectant have led to infections. So alcohol, we know we use a lot of it, but most of it is for disinfection rather than a high-level sterilization. All right, next slide. The documented shortcomings of alcohol on equipment are that they damage the shellac 
mounting of lens instruments, and they tend to swell and harden the rubber and certain plastic tubings after prolonged and repeated use. Bleach, rubber, and plastic tiles, and they damage the tonometer tips and so on. So they have looked at it and recognized that quite a lot of damage has been caused by use of alcohol. Corneal opacification has been reported um, when the tonometer tips were swabbed with alcohol Im immediately before the measurement of the intraocular pressure. And alcohols are flammable and consequently must be stored in a cool, well ventilated area. They also evaporate rapidly, making extended exposure time difficult to achieve unless the items are immersed. And I know, you know, we really do use a lot of alcohol. So this is just to kind of help us to, to, you know, look into it. All right. So in terms of high level, you can go back a little for the group. Go back, yes. So for the glutaraldehyde, which is one of our high level disinfectants, you know, it's, it's widely used, I, I guess most of us would know about the glutaraldehyde. It's a high level disinfectant and chemical sterilizer. The AKO solution of glutaraldehyde are actually, I generally in this case, are not sporadicidal, but only when the solution is activated or made alcohol, alkaline by using an alkaline, alkylating agent up to you know, pH of 7.5 to 8, does the solution become sporocidal? But once activated, these solutions have a shelf life of 14 days. And I know some of 14 days, and um, the, the, the polymerization block of the active sites, the, alde, the aldehyde group of this glutaraldehyde molecule are responsible for its biocidal activity. Although formal aldehyde alcohol is a chemical sterilant and formal formaldehyde is a high level disinfectant, the healthcare uses formaldehyde are limited by purity to fumes and its pungent odor at very low levels. So originally I said in a previous slide that you know a lot of persons should really get training as it relates to how to use it having the proper PPE, the proper um, N95 mask and so on. I think over the years, what we've been doing, we've been just mixing and not really paying attention to that. So for these reasons, um, you know, it, it, it is linked to carcinogens and nasal cancer, lung cancer, et cetera. So we should really limit the direct exposure to this. It is used in the healthcare setting to prevent viral vaccines as um, an embalming agent and to preserve anatomic specimens. Historically, it has been used to sterilize surgical instruments, especially when mixed with ethanol. In 1977, a survey found that it was used for reprocessing hemodialyzers and um, if used at room temperature, a concentration of 4% with a minimum exposure of 24 hours is required to disinfect disposable hemodialyzers. So, you know, they can be reused. But to minimize potential health hazards to dialysis patients, the dialysis equipment must be thoroughly rinsed and tested for residual formaldehyde before it is being used. The use of glutaraldehyde base. Solutions in healthcare is widespread because of their advantages, including excellent biocidal properties, activities in the presence of organic matter, non-corrosive action of the endoscopic equipment, thermometers, rubber, plastic, and so on. Next slide. Next slide, please. All right, so generally though, in terms of the other high-level high level sterilization that we would employ in our setting, we also have our Cydex solutions that we use. And similarly to the formal, formaldehyde, you know, it, it's the whole potency, the, the impact that it has on the eye, and also for the risk of, you know, inhaling from injuries. We also employ our, our um, where we wrap our, our, our instruments and our packs and so on. 
and we said them for autoclave. So autoclaving is another very important high level disinfectant, high level sterilization that we use. But we always have to go back to the beginning where we make sure that we would have washed our instruments properly, taken care to see that we're using the correct manual implement. So where it, where it has to do with an instrument, for example, a forceps, make sure that we use the brush to go through the hinges and grooves, where it has to do with a lumen, to ensure that we use our brushes, you know, with appropriate size to ensure that that is properly cleaned prior to us wrapping and sending to our, our um, autoclave. We pay attention as it relates to the expiry dates. We ensure that we have them properly labeled and so even when they are back, we also ensure, you know, to see how we actually pack them. We should be using our first in first out method. We should also ensure that where we have them packed is somewhere that is free from them becoming wet or um, contaminated with any other instrument. All right. So thank you. Not sure if we have any questions. Okay, thank you once again, Madam Lewis McDonald, for your presentation on high level sterilization. Um, hope again that we were able to garner some well needed information there. Um, and I know that they are that you now have questions regarding the two presentations that we have had: um, infection prevention in the community and high-level sterilization. All right, I see one question is already placed in the chat um, from Altia Ashman. Um, she's asking. I'm not sure if. Um, she's asking about the risk of contamination of other surfaces while leaving the area with your gong on to perform hand hygiene. All right, this um, this question goes to Mrs. Chisholm Ford. Um, I don't know if you. Thank you, Desmond. I'm still here. Yeah. Uh, could you remind me of who's asking the question, please? Althea Ashman. Thank you, Althea, for that very good question. Um, but be reminded that you do not leave the area. Remember, we're in the home. You do not leave the area um, in your PPE. So all your doffing and donning is done while in the home. So when you are going to, when you're doffing, remember I told you that there's a sequence to your doffing. And this is done while in the home and you secure your um, material in biohazard bags. <clears throat> and these are, this can be disposed of in the regular garbage as well as um, you can leave it with a client, but you do not take it with you unless it is contaminated with blood. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we have another question. Um, from Venice Brown. Oh, oh, I'll tell you, you were saying something. Yes, good, good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. No oh, evening. Oh. Very good presentation. I was based, okay, for example, I'm giving a scenario in which, for example, you're, you're finished taking care of the patient, whether in the room or so. I mean, while leaving out of the room to go and perform hand hygiene, your gum may come in contact with other surfaces or the gloves or so. So I'm just wondering, you know, if it shouldn't be mentioned how the removing the PPE should be done exactly. That may be in a corner or so without touching the, the gun, touching other surfaces, whether the door or the, or the faucet or, you know, things like that. Because the gun would be contaminated at that time. I shouldn't be touching any surfaces at all. Um. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. Thank you for that again. Um, remember, you are already in the home. Yes. 
So you are the, 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 the duffing is really protecting you. Whatever microorganisms that are on your gown would have already been in the home because you would have sanitized your hands. You would have performed your hand hygiene. You would have had your proper face mask on when you are entering the home. And remember, you're going to be using a gown if you are going to be restraining your client or you're going to be handling um, bodily fluids, like if you're going to be doing a dressing or you're going to be um, doing um, personal care. So whatever organisms are there already belonged to the, um, the, the person in the home. However, your point of um, doffing in a corner is very important, yes to protect you from taking the organisms from the home back out with you. Oh, so the aim is to keep the organism in the home. Oh, I just understand. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And if I might just copy onto that, Desmond, if you are um, duffing, the onus is on the healthcare provider to ensure they're not touching anywhere. Yeah. And do remember that you duff you duff and sanitize. You duff, you sanitize after you duff each piece of PPE. Okay. We have another question from Venice Brown. Um, why are bedpans listed as non critical? Why are bedpans listed as non critical? Um, all right, thanks for that, Ms. Mon. So it's non-critical because it's not going to be going into the body cavity of the, of the patient. It's basically just the intact skin most of the time. So that's why it's a non-critical. The critical ones are the ones that are going to be going within the body cavity of the individual. Okay, great. Um, uh, another question from Debian Galloway. Um, I, I suppose a follow up to that question that we just answered um, is just washing the bedpan and vomit sputum containers okay versus sterilizing them? All right. So, like we said before, you have to ensure that you wash them. You will, you, it depends on, on you know, what. The situation is in terms of the patient's diagnosis. Washing with soap and water thoroughly, using the correct brush, for example, you know, to ensure that you would have gotten through all the crevices can suffice. However, if the patient has, say, for example, a sinister bacter, then you'd want to also do a further disinfecting by using, you know, soaking in bleach. And if you do have that sterilization in terms of heat, like a, a, a boil or something that you could put in, that, then that is also going to improve on the cleanliness or, the, or the, 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 to get rid of whatever bacteria might have been there, especially in the presence of certain bacteria or spores. So I think that is one such thing that you have to make sure that you are a little bit more detailed. But soap and water with that manual brush and rinsing can suffice in terms of a bedpan or a vomit bowl. Okay, can I help? Sure. Yes, yes. Um, thank you. Thank you, um, Desma. Thank you, Lillian. And uh, we must be mindful that um, Lillian spoke of three levels of disinfection and, and she did identify the bedpan and be mindful that it is either metallic or plastic and it should um, first be cleaned and cleaning the only cleaning that is recognized is soap and water. And after cleaning, then you disinfect. So it's a two-step process. And I did speak of that in the home as well. So you clean and then you disinfect. It's the same thing if, we, if you are in a restaurant and you are um, using utensils, you clean them first, you know, you remove the, the, the excess food and then you, you rinse out the excess things out of the plate, you wash it with soap and water, and of course, you're going to put it in a sanitizing solution. So the disinfecting process 
should never be omitted when you are um, approaching patient care and infection and prevention and control. So you disinfect first, sorry, you, you clean first, sorry, and then you disinfect. And it's generally with a, with a bleach solution. And as Lillian said, that there are some times that um, a 70% or 90% alcohol solution is also effective. Okay. Um, another question from Althea. Um, Sablon is a common disinfectant. Can it be used in any of the processes? So, just as my colleague just said, you clean first with soap and water, and then you can use the Sablon. So it can be utilized. Just don't use the sablon instead of using soap and water. Okay. All right. Are there any other questions? We have had another very informative session this afternoon. And um, I'm sure we leaving with we live in richer in terms of our knowledge of infection control. All right, so if there are no other questions, I would like to hand back over to our president, um, Cheryl Garrick Sloy, who will close us off. Thank you so much, Desmond. Thank you to our participants and thank you to our nurse of the year, Mrs. Lewis McDonald, and um, as we like to call her at the U.S. School of Nursing, Mona, our resident public health specialist, Mrs. Chisholm Ford, for this evening's presentation. So we have just two small things to complete. We've been asked, some of the persons would have heard on Monday, but just in case you're joining us for the first time, just a little bit about who we are as a chapter, because some persons have not heard of us before they saw the flyer for the webinar. That's one. Um, two, we have a few public service announcements. And three, we're closing with a quick activity that comes with a prize. So just wait for that so that we can close off. So let me start with the public service announcements, please. Um, it pains my heart to say this, colleagues, we have been having a lot of challenges with the registration for these sessions. We had the same issues in April. And when I say a lot of challenges, I'm highlighting some of the things. One, persons have gone ahead and registered when they get to the section to um, pay the information. It also gives our chapter's email address right there. And it asks that persons email us a copy of their receipt. Many people are not sending any email and then they're reporting that they have not gotten any link. Um, two, Many persons did not bother to upload, although it did ask you to upload a copy as well as to send the email. Some persons are asking us about the number. We asked for the number. That would be when we get to the account. We are not going into the account for everybody who registers. We are using a picture with the amount you paid for as the proof that you've paid so that we can put you on our official register. Three, I know that should be something we all know, but it's basic and common manners and courtesy when an email is sent to put a salutation in it. And in this instance, it would be good to say, please see the receipt attached. I have registered for this, 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 and that session. Many people are sending their emails with nothing but the attachment. Four, we're asking people, when you've ticked in the registration form and you have registered, please make a note of your sessions. Go back to the flyer, write your topic down, write your dates. People are turning up for sessions they didn't register for or people are emailing to say they don't know when the sessions are. The responsibility is yours to know what sessions you've registered for and what dates they are. All sessions start at 4.30 p.m. We are streaming live on our YouTube channel. So it means that though it's live and you're watching over there, you're also able to go back afterwards if you wanna just go back over some of what you've learned in the session today. The registration form is closed 24 hours before any presentation. In order for us to have a wonderful evening, good presentations, and to be on time, 
there is no way that the nurses who are part of this chapter are also manning the email, manning the Zoom room, manning the YouTube channel and responding to people at a half hour, an hour, two, three, four or five hours before we begin the sessions. We're asking our colleagues to just put a little more pep in your step regarding registering and completing the process. So registration is closed at the moment. It will be reopened tomorrow night at 8 p.m. because we have another session tomorrow. So it is not gonna be open today because 24 hours are gone. So tomorrow night, if you have joined us in YouTube and you have not yet registered or you paid and you have emailed, then we should be able to respond to you after that because you would have completed your registration. If we don't have you registered, even if you send us an email, the link doesn't get sent because we have to ensure we have an account of you. Similarly, we have people who have registered and they have not paid, they've not uploaded, we haven't heard from them. We want everybody to benefit. We're doing the sessions, not just because we want, but because it's important to get these hours, particularly for the infection control. And we try to find very interesting topics for our non-nursing because you also need to have that. So we're reminding you that the registration form will reopen tomorrow night at 8. It will close on Sunday at 5 p.m. because our next session is on Monday at 4.30. If you click on the form and you were not complete or you didn't do anything or you have done something but you want to amend it, it gives you the option to edit your response. Please do not register two and three and four times. And then we're asking you where it tells you the account information to pay. The chapter email is there. Can you please just note that so you're able to correspond with us? The last sets, there are people who are here today um, who have registered as one name. So for instance, we have a something Graham and you're joining with a double barrel name, or we have somebody who registered as a something Brown and they are just joining us here as just the Brown. It is a challenge for us to find you when we're marking the register. We've asked people to register with their names and we ask you to join as you registered. And we're asking you, if you want your certificate to be in the name you've registered, can you go back and edit it if it's not correct? Because any name you've used to register, that's the name we're gonna be sending your CE certificate in when we have completed that kind of um, our sessions and our hours and tallied them. I see a hand. Okay, and I'm seeing your hand. Or is that an old hand? Or if you're talking, we're not hearing you. All right, so in the interim, just a few things because we have been having a challenge. We're all nurses. It's very paining to my heart to be able to go right ahead and have to share some of these. All the slides and all the information that was presented belongs to the presenters. And you should be able to find them if you go over the presentation on YouTube. Barring that, you could maybe message the presenters and see if they'll allow you to, to um, get some of the information. Kayan, I'm still seeing your hand. I'm seeing your hand, um, May Daly. Good afternoon. I'm asking how I would receive the certificate if it will be emailed to me and I print it out. That is correct. Okay, thank you. All right. Can it doesn't soon. seem to show where your hand is up, Can. All right, so I'm not sure why Can's hand is up. Uh, Ms. Daly, you had another question? I was asking how soon we would get the certificate. There's no guaranteed date at this point. The last seminar we had, webinar series that we had, the certificates were sent within a month okay, um, thank you. of the session's completion. Rochelle? Yes, good night. Um, I'm just wondering. Mm -hmm. Rochelle, we lost you. Yes. All right. Okay, we are hearing you again, Rochelle. Go ahead. Mm, you're gone again. All right, colleagues, until Rochelle comes back, my apologies, but we are finding it necessary to share all of these um, because sometimes um, word of mouth advertising is best. And we have people, for instance, who are saying they are not in this session or they are not being allowed in. 
we cannot give CE hours to iPhone 10, Samsung G, to Bradley, to something toast or to somebody's surname only. We need to know who the persons are so that we can give an account for you and your hours. Rochelle, are you back with us? Yes, I'm here. You're hearing me now? Yes, I am. Yes. So um, when we were when I was registering and it, uh, the question was asked, how many days I wanted to register for? I only saw six days. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm wondering, um, because it's on the flyer, the seven, it says from the 15th to the 25th, which would be 10 days. So I would like to know um, if there are any or what days did you pick? Day. We are only having six days of our webinar series. It started on the 15th and it will end on the 25th. I registered for six days, but I don't know the exact six days. The onus is on you to go and see the flyer and know which days you registered for Miss Walker. I don't, I'm not sure I'm understanding. Okay, what, what are you not understanding? What days did you register for? So I registered for all six days, but I didn't see a date that says November, this November, that I'm not sure of the days. So you're saying that you did not see the flyer? No, I don't have the flyer. And you're saying when you clicked it, there, it doesn't give you the date for the sessions? I'm, I, yeah, I don't see, I don't know the dates. But it's, I don't know if it's there, but I didn't see it. All right. Well, I, I would encourage you to go, go back, back to this. And see. You can go back, Rochelle. The registration will be reopened tomorrow evening at 8 p.m. Okay. All right. All right. And for all the okay. persons, the link is sent to you. It's the same link for all the sessions. All right. We're Thank also you. Having, we're asking our colleagues, Rochelle, as you brought that point up, can you please make a note of the sessions you've registered for? If we have you registered for today and tomorrow and not for the other days and you turn up, we're not going to allow you into the Zoom room and we're having persons who are doing that. All right. So in the interim, just in case you wanted to ask, you can find us, as you will know, on our YouTube channel. And I will just go ahead and let me see if I could find the PowerPoint that I want to share with you. And let me just go beyond this one really quickly and let us see if we can start a conversation here. So in 1922, we had six nursing students. They wanted to have a activity in nursing school that suited what they were doing in their training. And so they started what is now called the Omega Kappa, um, Sigma Theta Tau International Honor Society of Nursing began at the Indiana University Training School in Indianapolis. So our headquarters are actually in Indianapolis in the USA. So the three names that are recognized for our organization are Storage, Tharsos, and Time, which means love, courage, and honor, which we believe exemplifies nurses and nursing. So we are a nonprofit organization and the vision of the organization is to have connected, empowered nurse leaders who are transforming global healthcare. We want to develop nurse leaders anywhere at all to improve healthcare every single place. Nurses are the backbone of the healthcare system. So we have students who are a part of our organization, undergrad and postgrad, and we also have nursing leaders. There are about over 135,000 members currently with over 500 and 40 active chapters, and we're in over 100 countries. If you have an interest, the general stigma requirements include that you should be in a nursing program, should be achieving academic excellence based on your program, should be in the top 35% of your class, should have completed at least a half of your nursing program. And for those persons who are doing a completion, meaning you're already an RN and doing your degree, you should have at least completed 12 hours. That's for undergrad or graduate students, so if you are a student nurse and not a nursing student, then you should have completed a quarter of your curriculum. Also, you need to have, um, you're achieving academic excellence and we expect you to meet academic integrity standards. And our nurse leaders must be recognized to practice in their country, have a minimum of an undergrad degree, doesn't have to be nursing, but an equivalent field, 
and we need to see evidence of your achievements in nursing um, in any form or outside of nursing because it also includes service. Sigma offers career mentorship, a lot of professional development courses, a very big e-repository of research and presentation. We have several academies, not just writing, but leadership as well. Um, two of the largest and most recognized nursing journals, the access to grants to be able to do research, to network, to volunteer. And they have a annual, semi-annual, biannual, and um, monthly sometimes webinars, seminars, and conferences. So Omega Kappa, we call ourselves OK. Um, was a dream that started 25 years ago. We are actually chapter 560, and we're at the U School of Nursing, Mona. With our members, however, across the Caribbean, because we're the only chapter in the Caribbean, and so our members are in Jamaica, Trinidad, and Tobago, the Bahamas, the USA, and England, and we are, are about two and a half years old. We got chartered on the 30th of May, 2019. We do have students, and we do have nursing leaders, and we are actually uh, regional award-winning chapter and a Sigma International award-winning chapter. We just shared a few of our pictures um, in the time that we have been chartered a little bit before because we were operating as an honor society before we were officially a chapter. And though they, we, are, we have been having a pandemic, we have managed to try and maintain our activities to the best that we can so that we are able to meet the requirements of being a chapter. Um, this last one, we went to the convention, just concluded in Indianapolis last week, and we collected our chapter award. And I was also nominated for the Outstanding New Member Award across the organization, and I was successful with that. So that's just us there. So currently, we're working on some new benefits for our members, because people always ask, you have to pay, what do I get? Um, so we don't only want to say you're going to get personal and professional development. There are some things that you have to get. Um, so we're looking at new things like um, research grants from our chapter, um, assistance to our members to renew their dues, it's annual. We're looking at things like working on programs to develop nurses across our country and our region. We participate in the Sigma activities. We're making ourselves more visible. We really want to be a part of improving the image of nursing. And we have to work on ensuring that the mission and vision of Sigma are being maintained here so that we are impacting nurses, nursing and healthcare. So in addition to Sigma's requirements, if you're interested, our students need to have an application letter of why they're interested in joining. We need a copy of their latest transcript and two recommendation letters from their school of nursing. Um, if it's a, you're a nurse leader, we need an, a letter as well with an updated resume for you or CV and two recommendation letters, including one from your current place of employment. You can find us. Um, Sigma's website is open and we can put those in the chat as well for everybody to find a little bit more about Sigma and the work they've been doing. And then you can also find our chapter. So we're Omega Kappa, that's sigmanursing.org and Sigma is just sigmanursing.org. We're on Facebook as Omega Kappa Chapter. We're on Instagram as Omega Kappa Caribbean and our YouTube channel is Omega Kappa Chapter of Sigma. And here's the email address we're asking you to message us through omega.kappa.chapter560 at gmail.com. So that's just a little bit about us. I keep this slide because it's an excellent reminder from our CEO. Um, she used it for Nurses Week this year that as nurses, we should never forget the light that we bring, the difference that we make and the lives that we change. Sometimes, especially in this pandemic, we are overwhelmed. We are very burnt out, we are very tired, but it's just a reminder for us. And this was us on our chartering day, all excited. Um, I guess we're tired too, because along with the excitement, it wore off a little and we realized we actually have to do a lot of work to ensure we're impacting nurses and nursing and healthcare, but we're still very excited. So if you have any questions, you can reach out to us at the chapter's email address. Also, um, at the signature of the email, there's a phone number for the school and there's my phone number as well just in case you need to just ask any questions. If you know a member of the chapter, reach out and ask them questions. A lot of our moderators and presenters are members of the chapter. So thank you for listening. I look out for your questions. And then to close off our evening, we have before, one last I, thing. No, no, we're not before, finished. Let's have one last thing, Desmond. No, go no, right ahead. I, yes, go ahead. Um, there's a question in the chat here. Um, yes, read it for me. Um, what is the procedure if you join 
YouTube for two sessions, but not yet registered. The person will be willing to pay for the days tomorrow. All right. So um, for many people who would have reached out, are there a few people who reached out because the registration was closed? We asked them to join on YouTube to write their names in the chat. So that's another thing we're reminding persons on Zoom, we let you into the Zoom room using your full name. So you don't need to put your name in the chat. If you're on YouTube, we ask you to type your name because not everybody's login is their name. We make a note because a register is marked after the sessions have started. And then when registration is open, you're able to go ahead and complete it and send your email with a copy of your receipt. And we will acknowledge that you have paid because your record is here that you have attended the sessions. So when you put your name over on YouTube, we are making a note of those who have put their names over there because some persons who have done so have not yet registered and we're hoping that they will register since they are joining us on YouTube. The information is out there. The channel can be found. We do have some people who are joining us on Zoom who did not receive the Zoom link from us and the email did ask persons not to share that information. So we're just again reminding us about honesty and integrity. Right. So um so that person will have to just pay complete the registration form. Yeah, they'll have to get the link and register complete. Right. The so that registration will be reopened tomorrow at 8 p.m. because we are saying we're closing it 24 hours before each session to give us time to make sure everything is in order. Since we also have a session tomorrow evening at 4 30, we mm. won't open it until 8 p.m. tomorrow and it will close at 5 p.m on Sunday because we have a session on Monday. So we ask them to register. It's the same link that they had before, we will reopen it. Um, and that will give them the opportunity to complete the registration. And it is also where they're able to go ahead and find the email to go on and send the email to us so that we can verify um, that they have paid and they are registered. And we ask persons, the previous webinar series and other activities we've had are on the channel over on YouTube. We're streaming all of these sessions and we'll be adding other activity. They could always subscribe to the channel so that they're able to get the notification when we're starting a session. So if you're on for this series, for instance, and you have forgotten sometimes, if you are subscribing to the channel, it will send you a little ping to remind you that the session has started. Um, there's another question. Is it possible to get a certificate before a month's time, as I said earlier? No, that's not possible. All the persons in the chapter are nurses. We may have to consider if we could get somebody who could be um, like an administrative person. The certificates are e-prepared and have to be sent out. There's, I, we do not wish to guarantee before a month and have persons asking and they are not ready. That's why we say at least a month to ensure we're able to get all of them prepared and sent out. We do have... I believe maybe 200 persons registered. It takes a while to prepare 200 certificates. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can the form from council be filled out in the meantime? And the other question is how would, how would they be able to get that done and signed in the interim? As it is right now, we are located in the School of Nursing and we are either working from home and are in clinical spaces. So it's, there is nobody per se from the chapter who is sitting in the building at USON would be able to complete the form. Um, can midwives join the chapter? Not at this time, unless they are nurse midwives, the honor societies for nurses. Okay. All right. Um, Those were the questions. Um, There's Madam, one more. Ma Madam President, can I? Yes. Add, I, I, I think I am understanding some of the questions that our, mm -hmm. our colleagues are posing. I think many of many of us are concerned about the, the, uh, the expiration of our licenses on the 31st and our, many persons are hoping to use these hours to um, to, to relicense. 
Yes, and um, we're aware of that, but I, we we do not wish to guarantee anything that we will not live up to. Well, I I, I, I am offering for the persons who are at the Victoria Jubilee Hospital or KPH, you can find me with your receipt. If you have your receipt, you can find me at the BCG room. I will sign your form for you so that for the time that I have for the presentation that I have done, if that can um, help. And that, that form will need to be taken to the School of Nursing to have to the school stamped. stamp on it for the council to be able to accept that. The certificate we are preparing will look at the register once we are complete next Friday and they will get it with an account for all the hours of the sessions. If persons are only going to be, for instance, getting your session signed off, we would need to know that so that we don't give them a certificate with those hours if they were signed. So we're not saying we won't try. We're also not saying we don't understand that they are concerned about the um, hours and the time when it gets completed. But we are not trying to guarantee what we can't live up to, considering that many of us, including myself, who will work on the certificates, have a very full workload in the interim and we want to ensure we do the certificates correctly. So we ask persons, just again, go back and edit your response on the form if you didn't type your name the way you want it on the certificate. So you don't send it back and say your name isn't correct and that we will try to ensure we could get them out as soon as we can, hopefully before the month is done um, or by the end, the next week is the 25th, maybe by the second starting of the second week in December, but we will not guarantee and promise that we can get it to you before that time. The certificates oh, will not be at the School of Nursing. The certificates are key <laughs> certificates. Uh, Sandra, um, there's a question for you. Um, there is someone from Excel, assistant lecturer at Excel. She wants to know if she can come meet you at, at um, the hospital as well. Um, sorry, Desmond, um, Madam President did clarify that my, my the, the session that I have presented would be the oh. only sessions I'd be willing to sign for. So that may not be able to help. Okay, okay. All right, so with the, the exigency of the situation, we can tell you that we will, we will try, but we will not make a promise because once we give our word, then we expect to live up to it and we know our colleagues are gonna be emailing to say, you said by November 30 and we haven't seen the certificates and we can't guarantee by the end of the month. So it means that going forward, we will try to ensure as much as possible if we're able to have the sessions done a little bit earlier, we apologize that this year we are doing it in November because of the activities we had to complete coming down to the end of October and there was nowhere to fit those in before um, this week and next week. Are there any other queries? Or I hope I've answered all of them. So we will give it our best try, but we, and we hope that we'll be able to assist persons. We're getting their certificates before they get to the end of December, because we also know that before Christmas is going to be a period when we are, the council will not be in um, commission. All right. So if we have no more questions, just before we go off, because we were finished a little early today, but we thank you for joining us and you will still have your two and a half hours. It doesn't matter if we're done before. We had two sessions. Um, the last part is really just a little bit of fun, a little bit of double checking on what we've learned. So we're giving the YouTubers, it will come over just a little bit delayed, but we're putting it up just right now. So this is the last thing we want to ensure that everybody gets it correct. We are giving you two minutes, whatever you know if you need to. Let me say a minute first, and you could always cry out if you need another minute. You need to unscramble the letters that we have shared. It's all about infection control, and we need the correct responses. Karen Vidal Graham, you're writing on our screen, the correct responses. And then first person to put how many responses they have when the time is done, 
we will make a note of that. And then we will ask those persons to send a picture to my phone so we can verify that the amount you have is correct. So let's do the instructions again. I'm going to put the picture up. The words are on it. It's going to be a minute. You are going to write it down where you are doing the, in, the words so that you will be able to take a picture of that when you're done. And then at the end of a minute, we're asking people, put in the chat. Say if you got two words, three words, four words, five words, put the number you got, not the actual words. Then we will look at who has the most and we will ask you to send a picture so we can verify that you do have the words you say that you have. Everybody ready? I'm not hearing any answers. Everybody's ready? Yes. Or you want the instructions no, one more time? Get a piece of paper or use your phone. If you have notes on it, you're going to be writing. We're going to put up the scramble. You're going to have to unscramble the words that are on it. And you're getting one minute. <clears throat> when the one minute is up, you're going to type in the chat, either on Zoom or YouTube, how many words you have. So if you got six, put six. If you got five, put five. If you got 10, put 10. And then when we look to see who had the most words, we will ask those persons to send a picture so we can verify. The person who has the most words within the time frame will get the prize for tonight. Everybody ready now? Yes. Wonderful. Let's go. And the time has started. Whoops, sorry about that. Let me just move this so that it's not in your way and you can clearly see. There you go. All right, one minute is up. No cheating. Stop writing. No cheating. All right, so now we are going to be looking in the chat so we can see the persons are now supposed to be putting how many words they came up with. YouTube, how are you doing over here? How many words were you able? To come up with write the number in the chat you got five you got three you got two you got one who is it that put that let's go i'm not hearing any pinging yet are you still trying to figure it out if you're cheating we're gonna stop you know all right ready now we're seeing i see five six Four. Oh, so we have one person with six so far. Mm -hmm. Four, two, two. Anybody else? Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. We are not accepting any more answers. Thank you. So it means that Lashana, Lashana Gail Cummings, might I ask you to check? Yeah. May, might I ask you to go to the email that I would we would have sent to you? My number is at the bottom of that email. Send me a picture of your six words so we can verify. Over on Zoom, we have a Renz B, who is Renee. We're asking her, we need a photograph so we can check. If these six words are correct, based on what we have. Thank you so much for participating. Um, we know that maybe some persons would have joined us late. While we are doing all these things again, 
the challenges we expect you to be here for 4 30 we know it's a little bit hard for nurses but if you're coming in at this hour you may have missed the session if you are in the zoom waiting room because while i was presenting i think i forgot to make somebody co-host today and so some persons would have dropped out or some persons just came in after i started talking all right so those are our participants those are two people for all of you who got six and two and five we thank you for participating actively um those on youtube as well because we know it came over a little delayed so thank you so much and if you have registered for tomorrow we will see you tomorrow evening and we're going to be talking about the hottest topic these days in the world vaccines and the cold chain is that correct mrs chisholm ford Um, Lashana, I see your hand. Go ahead. That's correct, Madam President. Um, I'm only, is it your personal email address I should look for? No, I'm no, the, the email oh, that came oh. from the chapter. Okay, all right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're very welcome. So thank you everybody for participating. Have a very good night and see you tomorrow. Or if not, see you on Monday of next week. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.